Well, happy Sabbath. It's November 5th, 2017. This is going to be called Prepare to Serve the God of Love and Righteousness on an LDS Mission. <clears throat> so I'll put this kind of in the series that I started about, you know, so you want to serve an LDS mission. We're on LDS.org, and I'm going to start off where it's going to tell us how glorious and wonderful the God of Israel is. The God of Mormonism, presumably the God of Christianity and Judaism. Just that, you know, if you're in the true church, you've got a bit of a clearer view about the majesty of God. So we're going to differentiate God from the wicked gods of this world. <clears throat> the gods of men, the gods of Babylon. Because if you're going to serve an LDS mission, you really need to understand what we have learned about our glorious God. And we have these terrific prophets that are going to help us. We've got the scriptures, and LDS.org itself is a really... Uh, well done resource for information on Mormonism. So, uh, this is going to be interesting. Pay attention. You'll know a lot more about God in a few minutes. Starting off here, so this is uh, from uh, <clears throat> one of the lovely correlated lessons here. It's about Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, what do we call on this now? Old Testament Student Manual, Genesis 2. It also says Samuel on it. Well, anyway. Let's go. If I sound a little too calm, don't let that get to you. This will be rather interesting, I promise. Well, I try to keep my promises, I really try. Okay, introduction. Adam and Eve were the crowning point of the creation. But pause for a moment to think of the creation itself. It was the Father directing creation of a home for his children. When it was finished, the record states, with beautiful simplicity, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Genesis 1.31, the reference for that. The record. So we're calling Genesis a record. And so it had been in the thousands of years that have elapsed since, the earth is a place of beauty and abundance. So it's been thousands of years since God finished creating the earth. Thousands. Not millions. Not billions. Not hundreds of millions in between there. Thousands. So forget all that garbage you learned in school. Those Darwinian people are misled by the gods of this world. The earth is a place of beauty and abundance. A place of self-renewal and constant recreation, not to be confused with recreation. It has been the mortal home for billions upon billions of people, and yet still is, a capa is capable of sustaining billions more. We're not running out of resources, people. It is the word of the Lord. Ponder for a moment your own relationship to Adam and Eve, your ever-so-great grandparents. Some of you may have traced your genealogy all the way back to them. I knew people that said they had. Have the ensuing millennia made them seem unreal to you? Like fictional characters in a novel? They are real, and they are alive. Adam will return to earth prior to the millennium to preside 
I love that word. They like to use it at state conference and things like that. Especially when we've got someone really special presiding like the mission president or a visiting area authority or 70. Used to have apostles. Millions, millennium to preside under Christ. Let's reread that. They are real, Adam and Eve, and they are alive. Adam will return to earth prior to the millennium to preside under Christ. I wonder where Eve will be. At the great council of Adam and I, Amen. See, Daniel chapter 7, Doctrine and Covenants 116. 116's a, a great one when you've got an assignment to read an entire section of the Doctrine and Covenants. If you're in a hurry, pick, pick 116. It's only one verse. It just says that Adam and I am in is Davies County, Missouri. Who knew? And he will lead the armies of the Almighty God to battle against the assembled hosts of Satan. Sounds like Jehovah's Witness General Conference or something. In the last great battle of the earth, see Doctrine and Covenants section 88, verses 112 to 115. Okay, so there you have it. The world will would have you believe that Adam and Eve were primitive and superstitious, that they brought about the fall through immorality. You remember in school when they told you Adam and Eve were just immoral, so that's why the world fell away from Kolob. I don't think I remember that one, but maybe I went to the wrong school. Or even that they were imaginary. Mm, that one I've heard. Mythical persons. But as you read about them, remember how the Lord views these two great souls. Think of what special qualities they must have possessed to have been chosen to lead the way. You've probably read the account of the creation before, perhaps many times. But as you read and study it now, ponder its real significance for you today. There we have it, people. The creation is real. It took place in six days, according to Genesis. 6,000 years, according to Peter, revising that a little bit. Maybe it didn't seem very believable. And then in the book of Abraham, of <clears throat> such famous note, uh, we have creative periods. doesn't necessarily say they are days, and maybe that opens it up. God is revising things to make things more believable for us. Then again, what God is it? Because the book of Abraham says there's a whole bunch of gods involved. Well, it doesn't say whole bunch, it's just plural. The gods. There's like a council of gods or something. It doesn't give us a number of how many gods were involved. But that is a, a very important book to LDS theology. Instructions to student instructions, blah blah blah. Okay, so um, because the because of because the parallel accounts in Moses one through three and Abraham four and five contain valuable insights and additions not found in Genesis, not found in the Christian Bible, they should be read and studied in connection with the Genesis account. The books of Moses and Abraham are studied in detail in the Pearl of Great Price course, Religion 327. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> when was in the beginning? Oh my, this might be a good one too. <clears throat> I just wanted to see what they have to say here on this, just briefly. It says, <clears throat> notes and commentary on Genesis 1 and ch chapters 1 and 2. It says, when was in the beginning? At least two important points should be made about the these opening words of the Bible. First, beginning is a relative term. Ooh, we're getting relative now, are we? And does not mean the starting point of all eternity. 
If indeed there can be such a thing. If indeed there can be such a thing. It sounds like you're questioning some theological premise that we've already heard at some time. The Lord told Moses that he would speak only concerning this earth. That's in the Joseph Smith version of the Bible, uh, which we have the beginnings of in the Pearl of Great Price in the book of Moses. <clears throat> the creations of God are too many for man to number, as it states, and many other worlds have already passed away, as it states in <clears throat> reference Moses chapter 1 thus in the beginning refers only to this world's beginning President Brigham Young explained when was there a beginning there never was one if there was there will be an end but there never was a beginning and hence there never will be an end that looks like eternity when we talk about the beginning of eternity, it is rather simple conversation and goes far beyond the capacity of man. Discourses of Brigham Young. <clears throat> I read that book. But Brigham Young didn't write a book called Discourses of Brigham Young. So where's that taken from? That's taken from the Journal of Discourses, which records talks given by Brigham Young and his uh, associates, the apostles, back in those days. But they don't mention the source directly. They mention taking that out of the book that it was quoted in from the Journal of Discourses, and I've mentioned that before because you won't find the Journal of Discourses on LDS.org. It used to be that every member was supposed to have them. They were the <clears throat> ensign reports based they're their conference reports you know your semi-annual ensign um, <clears throat> publications that happen to have the conference reports in them that's what these were but they decided they didn't want us to have them anymore easily accessible and they don't make many references to them anymore in the lessons they used to but in this case once again we have the source veiled by not showing it exactly where that you know an original reference we've got this because it's filtered it doesn't because people might want to actually look at the journal discourses and it's not on the church website you can find it on the internet or maybe you've got family that's you know still got a copy that the church didn't manage to extract from them uh, you know, kind of like when they <clears throat> take back in the Federal Reserve notes and issue new ones. You know, take old substitutes for money out of circulation. Well, this is old speak, and we've gotten rid of that. So anyway, I don't want to dwell in this thing too long. And maybe I missed out one of the two things that they wanted to mention. But, uh... Because I, I, I had kind of an, uh, an agenda of what I wanted to talk about here. I recently listened to uh, Aaron Ra give a couple of uh, dissertations. And some things he says I haven't felt much agreement for. And other things he said, uh, basically he got straight out of the scriptures. And, uh, the, you know, they are what they are. And so if we're going to prepare to serve a mission for the LDS Church, we really need to know about that God that we represent and the theology that we're representing versus the gods of this world. And according to this, basically it would be the false gods of this world or the <clears throat> false ideas promoted by people that Adam and Eve were just mythical characters. This asserts that they definitely were real and as we know Joseph Smith said that they lived in Missouri 6,000 years ago. Actually only 5,000 years ago almost. A little more than that by the time they got ready to end their lives because they lived almost a 
You know, it doesn't say how long Eve lived. I guess she wasn't that important. But Adam was important because men are more important in the scriptures we find. And uh, he lived 930 years after they left the Garden of Eden. So, you know, 5,100 50, years ago, they were in Missouri, it says. Well, let's see what some of these other gods might be teaching us just real quickly. We want to understand the nature of God because this says he was so loving, he was preparing a place for his children. So when you get to be a god yourself and start creating worlds for your children after you've managed to have lots and lots of babies on your, in your celestial abode, um, you're going to want the very best for them, just like you do for your children now, and that's what they're basically telling us was the case. So, um, I want to make some observations about the world that was given to us, created for us here, to dwell upon and prove ourselves. And, uh, see, compare that in, 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 in the good God with the false God. So let's get in here. You know, first I, I'll... Man has in himself the seeds of Godhood which can germinate and grow and develop. Like the acorn becomes the oak, the mortal man becomes a God. It is within his power to lift himself by his very bootstraps from the plane on which he finds himself to the plane on which he should be. It may be a long, hard lift, but with many obstacles, but it is a real possibility. As we have stated before, we, the way to perfection seems to be a changing of one's life, to substitute the good for the evil in every case. Changes can come best if we take one item at a time. For instance, it's not difficult to be perfect in tithe paying. For if one pays one-tenth of his income annually, he is perfect in that respect. If one studies the scriptures with all reasonable devotion, he has approached perfection in that matter also. To be perfect, then, one must begin early in his life. He or she must become the perfect husband, the perfect wife, the perfect father, the perfect mother, the perfect leader, and the perfect follower. One's marriage must be perfectly performed and perfectly kept on a hallowed plane. One must keep his life circumspect. I want to make some observations about the world that was given to us, created for us here, to dwell upon and prove ourselves. And, uh, see, compare that in, in, in the good God with the false God. So let's get in here. You know, first, I, I'll just mention, so, uh, this fellow, uh, when we talk about the creation in the firmament, we now I did that in number one here a little bit. And so we know that the firmament, is, what do we know about it? It's a little difficult. The description of the earth, however, is not a globe, if we read what references we have in the Bible. And day four creation of the rest of the universe is conflicting with what they're saying here in the statement we just read. It just said this only pertains to this earth, but it says day four was all about creating the rest of the universe when we look at the creation. So how does that work? It clearly talks about the rest of the creation. The rest, you know, the, it says the sun and the moon and the stars were all created for the purpose of giving times and seasons and all that stuff giving light upon the earth as though that this earth was you know the center of all creation so they've differentiated there and basically contradicted what we have in the Genesis record and of course as, as we mentioned as I mentioned you know day four creating trillions of other stars you would figure the rest of the planets that are around them in other words the rest of the universe trillions and trillions according to what science tells us and as far as I know the church is telling us that that science is true 
I mean, when we look at the Book of Abraham, basically that's what we're talking about, that sort of newer science. But when we had the Book of Genesis written, things seemed to be a bit more Earth-centric, and it really is described as a, a round circle, flat Earth, apparently, with like a dome over it, the firmament that the stars were set in. Uh, and all created for the purpose of this earth. You know, it takes six days to make this earth, but one of those days they created the rest of the universe. We already went over that. Um, that's a tough one, huh? So now we've got to blend that with the whole new science uh, uh, saying that we've got, you know, a, a vast expanse of outer space with trillions of stars and that they're actually not with the moon like we are told in Genesis um, in that the four earth is divided into four quadrants uh, on its uh, circular base but I immediately came up to problems where I had to kind of ask mom, mom what was the firmament right nobody knows right it pieces of the firmament is described or it's described in pieces all over Genesis and a few other places and when you put them all together what it is, is that the earth is, according to uh, Isaiah, where they, they all want to point to this and say, you know, Isaiah said it's a circle, which means it's a sphere. No, it means it's a circle. The word they use actually meant like disc, not sphere, or ball. And so the earth is this flat disc. It's divided into four quadrants. And it's set under a giant crystal dome that has windows in it to let the rain in. Why? Because it's a snow globe in the bottom of an abyss. So space is full of water. And they have fountains that can bring the water in from the bottom, and they have windows that can bring the water in from above. So where's the sun and the moon and everything else? That is in the expanse of the dome. So the sun and the moon are the same size as each other, and they're both bigger than all the stars. Gets a little confusing. And they're all in the expanse up there. And all of these things have personalities, by the way. The stars can come down to the earth and you know, do battle with human beings, or they can be trampled upon because they're that tiny. So this is one of the things that I had a huge problem with. They're just the way that the, the Bible describes the earth is absolutely unrealistic according to everything we know about cosmology. Let's see how the God of the Old Testament, whom we are taught is actually Jesus Christ, wants us to deal with women when the husband suspects maybe they might have been unfaithful. <clears throat> And the spirit of jealousy come upon him, the husband. If the husband gets suspicious, but the woman hasn't been caught, but if he suspects that she's been fiddling around, <coughs> and the spirit of jealousy comes upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled, or the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled, <coughs> Then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he'll figure it out. And he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephah of barley meal. Okay, there's always something in, the, in it for the priest. They don't work for free. <clears throat> he shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy. An offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near, and set her before the Lord. Where's that? Where's the Lord? <clears throat> and the priest shall take holy water. Oh, sounds like a Catholic priest. In an earthen vessel. And the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle. Oh, the sweeping the dirt off the floor how nice the priest shall take and put it into the water here comes our dirt smoothie and the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and uncover the woman's head and put the offering of memorial in her hands which is the jealousy offering and the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causeth the curse the dirt smoothie and the priest shall charge her by an oath, and say unto the woman, If no man hath lain with thee, 
And if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. Okay, so it's kind of like the sac sacrament blessing. And it's saying that, you know, if you're innocent, this isn't going to poison you. <clears throat> but if thou hast gone aside to another instead of the husband, if thou hast... If thou be defiled, and some man hath, hath lain with thee besides thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse, and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot, and thy belly to swell. And this water that causeth the curse shall go into thy bowels to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. <laughs> and the priest shall write these curses in a book. Sounds like witchcraft to me. And he shall blot them out with the bitter water. And he shall cause the women, the woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse and the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. Sounds like it's already bitter. A dirt smoothie off the floor. Then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand and shall wave the offering before the Lord and offer it upon the altar. And the priest shall take an handful of the offering even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar, and afterwards shall cause the woman to drink the water. And when he hath made her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass that if she is defiled, and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causes the curse shall enter into her, and become bitter, and her belly will swell, and her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people." And if the woman is innocent, be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. This is the law of jealousies, when a wife goeth aside to another instead of her husband, and is defiled. Or, when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon him, and he be jealous over his wife, and shall set the woman before the Lord, and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. Then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity, and this woman shall bear her iniquity. Too bad they don't just have, like, the spirit of discernment, and they can tell if their wife is <clears throat> fiddling around by the power of the Holy Ghost. But instead they have to do witchcraft, basically, and uh, make her drink a dirt smoothie, and uh, depending on what the guys have been walking through that day, or the previous days, since the last time they swept the floor and disinfected it, which would be like never, um, see how sick she gets, and there you have it, that's God's way, that's Jesus' way of determining if, uh, a woman is guilty of infidelity. Make her drink a dirt smoothie, and if she's innocent, it won't hurt her. Terrific. <clears throat> Isn't there like a children's hymn that we can sing like, That's our bishop. That's our priest. That's our God. It's time for an holy feast. All right, enough of that. Well, you know, since it is the Holy Sabbath Day and Fast Sunday, I think it might be appropriate to sing a little bit here. This is a rare treat when I do this sort of thing. So maybe I can come up with some, you know, inspiring improvisation here to go along with Guide us, O Thou Great Jehovah. Wow. Actually, I haven't prepared anything. Um, I, I did have a, a couple of thoughts come into my head, though, regarding these scriptures, so let's see how I can do. 
tough to sing in the reclining position here. Guide us, O thou great Jehovah, guide us to the promised land. We are weak, but thou art able. Hold us in thy powerful hand. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, bring, oh, bring the welcome day. Bring, oh, bring the welcome day. If I think my wife was unfaithful, give her now the bitter pill. Therefore, if she truly is faithful, she will not then fall quite ill. Singing praises, singing praises, songs of glory unto thee, songs of glory unto thee. All right, I guess that gets the message across. Yeah, that was inspirational. I just had that come to me. So, um, trust Jehovah or Jesus Christ, whoever you, you know, if you like the Catholic name that they made up later, or basically the Greek name that the Flavians made up when they invented the story of Jesus. He's awesome. And just do what he says. Have the priest give your uh, wife the, um, you know, dirt off the floor of the... Uh, well, it was the tabernacle back then. And, uh, you know, it'll all work out because uh, you'll put a curse on it and uh, it'll only curse her if it's bad. So next time you're taking the sacrament and you wonder if the, street preach, if the priest that blessed it had been, you know, <laughs> if he'd washed his hands after the last time he had an itch to scratch or, or shake, shook, hands with somebody, shook hands with somebody else or if any of the children, you know, sorting through the bread had been crawling on the floor, or if anybody, you know, dribbled back leftovers from their sacrament cup while well, they were putting it back in the center, realize that it's the same kind of thing. God will protect you from the sort of illnesses that you might otherwise get as long as you're taking the sacrament worthily. Don't take it unworthily. It'll be to your condemnation. Maybe not just your spiritual condemnation, but, you know, somebody that shook hands with somebody else that was in the men's room. I forgot to wash hands before they, you know, blessed and broke the bread. That could be a factor, but it's all good as long as you partake, you know, worthily. Just like the poor women that were drinking the dirt smoothie off the floor. It's all about faith. So, let's take a look at what some of the gods of this world might do to us what sort of cruelty they might dish out upon people you've heard of those uh, horrible Islamic terrorists fundamentalists people that don't treat women well or anyone if they don't abide their religion. Let's see what they think about slavery. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant six years, he shall serve, and in the seventh year he shall go out free for nothing. So, you Allah worshippers, you have to only have a servant for six years, and the seventh year you set them free. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him, if he was married before he was sold into slavery. If his master has given him a wife, she and she have borne him sons, daughter, sons and daughters, or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. Oh, 
that's lovely. So after six years of service, if the guy happened to get married during that time, now he's got the family. The guy, the, the master says, uh, "All right, slave, you're free. Go ahead, but I'm keeping your family." Sounds like Brigham Young. And if the servant shall plainly say, "I love my master, my wife, and my children," I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door. Basically, any flat piece of wood will do. The door post, and his master shall <clears throat> bore his ear through with an awl. Basically, drill or punch a hole in his ear primitive ear piercings, they probably didn't have ice cubes. And he shall serve him forever. So, did we get that? The God of these people is, is, is giving rules for slavery. If you buy a Hebrew, you know, a Jew, a Hebrew, <clears throat> in this case, I suppose it goes for anyone, but it's mentioning the Hebrew. If you buy a Hebrew... And he serves the six years out, you know, you let him go. We had like seven year servitudes in the United States on these uh, deals where people were sold into slavery or some of them thought they were agreeing to something that was a little better than they got, the, you know, servitude that they got, indentured servitude uh, for passages, but half the people came to the United States in slavery and the rules for them were about as horrendous as this but anyway so um, you got if you weren't married before but now you are you got married during your servitude uh, you have to leave your family or you have to be a slave for the rest of your life for this uh, master what do you think about that God pretty pretty horrible huh no wonder we don't like the ways of Sharia law and the Islamics but wait a minute. This is the Jew God. This is Exodus. This is the Christian God. This is out of the Bible. This is our loving Heavenly Father giving His stamp of approval and His rules for slavery of His own people. I can imagine what it was for other people. Actually, we don't have to imagine we can take a look and see how he treats other people as well. So God approves of slavery. He has rules for it. And he says, you can lose, if, if you, after you serve your six years, if you weren't previously married, you got married during the time you were a slave, you lose your whole family. Or you can stay for the rest of your life and have no hope. In other words, so so your six years of servitude turn into a lifetime, and how does that how does that work for the rest of your family? It looks like they're stuck too. So, um, there are a few more rules, and I, I don't want to get into the whole chapter here, but uh, that's your loving heavenly Father. That's him. Now in Exodus and in Leviticus, we can read how um, if you're gay, you must be killed. That's the rule. Just kill them. Uh, witches, kill them. You know, so the Salem witch trials were, you know, they're Bible-based. Kill them. Uh, it didn't, you know. Uh, the talk that I heard uh, Mr. Arah give, you know, he, he's paraphrases and he he's, goes into some detail on some of these things but I wanted to look at a few of the actual scriptures just to see what they said you sh thou shalt not suffer a witch to live how do you determine if someone's a witch he described something that I've read about also if you think your wife might have been fiddling around um, there, there's there isn't a jury trial or things like that it's basically like the Salem witch trials as well. You take her to the priest. He mixes a, a dirt smoothie off the floor. Hopefully the guys haven't been walking through, you know. <laughs> well, how clean are your 
shoes. And they take the dirt off of the floor and mix it up, mix, mix up a nice smoothie and make her drink it and he casts a spell on it or something. And if uh, she's pregnant, then, uh, you know, her womb will cast out things, you know, if it was uh, not from the right husband. So basically it's a, a witchcraft abortion by the priests of Israel. <clears throat> with a concoction that would be pretty toxic sounding. And so I'll, I'll, I'm gonna put, play a little clip of what he had to say. Uh, this was a big one, abortion. There are passages in the Bible that talk about uh, ripping pregnant women open right, and removing their babies, right, obviously killing them in the process. That's not technically abortion, I wouldn't think. But there is a passage that seems to me to be exactly what abortion is and it seems to be a perfect description of that and of course every christian i've ever talked to about this gets adamant in their denial of this so if a man suspects that his wife has been unfaithful he can bring her to the priest and the priest will concoct this potion which is a cursed potion and she's supposed to drink this potion and if it is that she has been unfaithful to him according to some translations her womb will discharge or her thigh will rot and fall away. And I had to wonder, left or right? What are we talking about? What you, we got one-legged woman here that doesn't make any sense. And then I found out that uh, in, some, uh, in some Talmudic references, and I don't remember them off the top of my head, and they're in my notes, but I'm not going to search for them. There are some Talmudic references that talk about how the fetus is considered by rabbinic scholars to be only water from conception to the first 45 days. Only water, no consequence at all for the first 45 days. After that, and until birth, it is a limb of the mother. And one rabbi speci specifies that it is a mother's thigh, <laughs> which makes perfect sense now. The thigh will rot away. That's why other translations say that the, the womb will discharge. So what it means is if she was unfaithful, and why would a guy think that she was unfaithful? At a time when travel took a really long time to get anywhere and you could be gone for a month at a time, you come home and maybe you didn't favor all of your wives, so that you come home and one of them is pregnant when you think she shouldn't be. It's a good reason to suspect that she might have been unfaithful. So she's pregnant would be the most likely. It doesn't say ever that she's pregnant. It only says that the womb will discharge. Well, how is it going to discharge if there's nothing in it, right? Will rot and fall away. There's only one way to interpret that. The potion causes an abortion. And then it says, it specifies again, that she will be barren. And I say to the Christians, I say, well, what if she was pregnant when this happened? Well, it doesn't say she was pregnant. Oh, I, I get it. It doesn't say she's pregnant. It implies very strongly. But what if she was pregnant when this happened and it was going to leave her barren? But they can't accept that that is the obvious consequence. There can't ever be an admission of abortion that is not only condoned by God, but actually performed with his direct assistance. And you should see the backpedaling involved in getting out of that one. I wanted to look at some other scriptural references. Uh, maybe I can just bring up a few. Because I wanted to look at how God, our loving Heavenly Father, treats his children, especially people in classes that are um, marginalized. And we hear a lot of talk about those sort of things these days about marginalized people but did you realize it's from the Christian God the God of Israel the God of the Old Testament and we know that Christians try to associate themselves more with the New Testament but the problem is that Jesus in the story there um, says before Abraham was I am meaning that he's claiming that he is the God of the Old Testament and this is very uh, explicitly taught within Mormonism. He's called the God of the Old Testament. And some of the, well, the, the church leaders like to refer to that guy as Jehovah, even though Jehovah didn't exist and the Catholics invented him. Um, which is a problem for the Temple Endowment, and a problem for the Book of Mormon, and a problem for the Book of Abraham, but I'm not going to talk much about that at this point. I've done that before. But the important thing to note is that Jesus Christ, as he is somehow called, I'm sure no one was actually named Jesus Christ, but I've talked about reasoning for that. But this, this fellow that we call Jesus or Jesus Christ, um, he is supposedly the God of the Old Testament. He's this guy that said, you know, 
here are the rules for slavery for enslaving my you know chosen people now when we get into what he actually did with people that were not chosen um, I'm not talking about the gay people he said to kill um, or you know uh, other things within Exodus that I was actually looking at but um, I want to look at Numbers chapter 31 here because this is how the God of Israel is treating the people that he just told the Israelites to go wipe out and oddly enough they're also of Abrahamic descent through you know duh through Abraham through Keturah okay so here we are Moses marries one of them so he married he, he Moses marries uh, a daughter of the priest of Midian there of Jethro and so they are Midianites but Jesus in his pre-mortal state decides that he's not happy with some of the Midianites so he decides that he wants the Israelites to just commit mass genocide so they do but when they come back they've got I don't want to call them prisoners of war because well I guess they're prisoners of war it's just that the Israelites initiated the war and so Moses is not happy that they actually didn't wipe out everyone the soldiers did what he said they killed all the men who were guilty of protecting their families you know they were not at war this was a war of aggression but basically from what I've read it sounds like God was just ticked off that some of the women had enticed some of the Israelite men whom they're basically cousins to of uh, premarital sex or something possibly <clears throat> in fact there's one guy that took a Midianite bride uh, maybe they were just you know maybe they hadn't been married officially by Moses or one of his people so that some guy throws a javelin through them when they're like hanging out in front of the tabernacle and the guy was rewarded by Moses with the priesthood I guess he wasn't even a Levite but he got to become like honorary priest for doing the good job of murdering this couple anyway um, so they, they bring the women and the children that they haven't slaughtered and Moses is like what, what are you doing preserving these people and they've been you know like causing our people to sin but I'll tell you what you kill all the mothers so they kill all the mothers kill all the boys and kill any other girls that look like they could have been mothers in other words if they've been involved with men and they're not virgins um, so motherhood's an instant death being a boy is an instant death keep the girls and you can have them for yourselves do whatever you you know would like to do with them and here here's what we're gonna do we're going to uh, divide it in them up so a certain portion will go to the guy you know like half of them will go to the guys that were in the in the army here and the other half will go to the other dudes so there's you know less guys in the army so they get you know in other words they get, it sounds to me like they get more girls out of it as prizes of war and then we're going to take you know do the same thing with with the animals we're going to you know kind of do a deal here so if you were a soldier I guess it sounds to me I could be wrong but you, you get more prizes more women more animals and stuff and then of course we're going to have to pay tribute to the priests you know basically this is tax for the upper class um, kind of like the way things work in a lot of societies and uh, so we're going to tax you and you're going to give uh, a certain percentage to the priests uh, of uh, the animals and the women uh, but the priests you know they're going to make an offering to the Lord of course generally they tended to eat whatever uh, you know that's how they got their food I guess they, they they made the offering but then they also got to eat the barbecued goats and sheep and so forth so what it says in here is that uh, and levy a tribute unto the Lord of the men of war, of the men of the war which went out unto the battle, one soul of five hundred, both of the persons and of the beeves, and of the asses and of the sheep. So we're not differentiating here. And, and as we go, what we'll find out is, and take it of their half and give unto Eleazar the priest for an heave offering of the Lord. So they're making sacrifice of these animals and these girls these virgins they're making human sacrifice there's no differentiation between what is done between the women and the animals they're making an offering and heave offering to the Lord um, I've never been aware of any animals that were offered to the Lord that survived so there you have it that's our loving Heavenly Father or his representative Jesus Christ who basically spoke as if he was Heavenly Father according to 
Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve, who liked to explain that to us uh, in some of his, you know, diatribes, including Mormon doctrine. So, that's the deal. It's Jesus, the loving Jesus, representing your loving Heavenly Father, offering girls and women as human sacrifice after the other ones were already slaughtered. And if you're lucky, you just get to be given to the soldiers. And in case you haven't really read much about what happens in war when soldiers get girls, um, it's not something that promotes extending their virtue. Um, this is about as bad as it gets. You're slaughtering women, children, and they slaughtered the men. Men aren't bad guys for protecting their families, last I checked. Um, but uh, that's our loving Heavenly Father. These are not Islamic terrorists, or, although they are Abrahamic themselves. I really haven't checked out the Koran. You know, do they use Moses' stuff, or do they go all the way back to Abraham? Of course, Abraham was ready to sacrifice his boy. And uh, the primitive religions that existed thousands of years ago, and some still exist today, uh, demanded blood sacrifice, and the Jews are known for that, as well as the Aztecs and other American tribes and all over the world. And though we condemn these people for their heinous crimes, especially done in the name of Allah, here it is, the God of Christianity. It's pretty easy genealogy. You just go back to Jesus, saying he is the God of Christianity, and he says himself that he was the Old Testament God. So, um, it basically condemns all Christianity, Judaism, and um, I'll let someone else figure it out about Allah, but uh, this is your God, people. So, if you're ready to represent this, this loving God, what you have to realize is that you've been lied to, because if we actually check out his track record, he's got a history, and it ain't good. The Book of Mormon tells us we need to believe that God is merciful in uh, Moroni chapter 10, verse 3, I believe it is, as a prerequisite for finding out that the book is true through this wonderful prayer that people tell us. Read the Book of Mormon and pray about it, but the prerequisites stated right there in it, or before the part they usually quote, it, uh, include that believing that God is super merciful loving and all this stuff, and having faith in Jesus Christ, the Christian God, invented by the Catholics. Well, basically the Roman Empire, which be, which which developed the Catholic Church later to promote its own existence. Um, we'll take a little break here and uh, continue on. I wanted to mention that we see in various scriptural references how God feels about women. We're told, you know, women are on a pedestal, women are daughters of God, all this stuff at church, all this rhetoric, but if we actually look at what the scriptures tell us, we find a completely different story. If, if, if you want to talk about, you know, terms like being misogynist, well, that's the God of Israel, that's the God of the Jews, and the God of the Muslims. Um, if we look, at what the priests did when a man just said, oh, I think my wife might have been fooling around, so they give her the witch treatment, you know, give her the, the dirt bag smoothie off the uh, temple floor, or the tabernacle floor, the filth, just as an accusation. There's, there's, you know, you don't need to establish any evidence. The evidence is whether, or not, is whether or not she gets sick. If she gets sick, she was guilty. If she doesn't get sick, she wasn't. Yeah, that came from God. Apparently, well, that's what the Jews tell us, and that's what we are told, and that's what any Christian believes is the Word of God, because it's right there in the Bible, and they call it the Word of God. Articles of Faith, we believe it to be the Word of God, so far as it's translated correctly. Last I checked, the entire Joseph Smith translation, or inspired version of the Bible, I am not aware of that being corrected. Uh, there's a slight change in the First Corinthians, where Paul is telling us that women need to keep their mouths shut at church. Uh, if they got anything to learn, they can learn it at home from their husbands. But it really doesn't change the meaning much. Uh, he changes one word, so instead of saying it's a shame for ch women to speak at church, it says it's a shame for them to rule at church. 
Um, but it doesn't say, it doesn't change anything about telling them they need to keep their mouth shut and wait till they get home and ask their husband if anything means anything. Paul also says that basically women shouldn't be preaching anything uh, in Titus or Timothy. So, um, I mean, you know, if you're a girl, you, you, you don't, you, girls don't go on missions according to the Apostle Paul. They need to shut it, baby, and uh, ask your husband after you've gotten home and made him dinner, maybe. Um, that's, it's, it's right in there. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, maybe I'll go to that. Ephesians chapter 5 used to, maybe it still is part of the temple preparation classes. Um, you know, so they, they went through that and basically it says, uh, listen, wives obey your husbands. So um, you are definitely not equal. You, you are, un, you know, you, you need to obey. Just uh, listen and obey. And that's in Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, like I said, it's part of the temple preparation, which basically does, you very, does very little to prepare anyone about to, for the temple uh, experience, although it's much less creepy than it used to be, the last two changes. Um, that was it, you know, and of course you had the covenant, you know, you bow your head and say, yes, you will obey your husband, and of course, you know, that changed to saying you'll obey him, you'll hearken unto his words as he hearkens unto Elohim. So that, that basically created, uh, you know, a weasel clause for all the girls, which was probably very much deserved. And so what else do we have? We got, you know, they bring the, the, the woman taking an adultery to Jesus uh, to stone her. And Jesus says, nah, let's, you know, whoever's guilty casts the first stone. But they says she's caught in the very act. So obviously the question is, well, where the hell's the guy? Well, it's not his fault. A little slut was tempting him, you know? If you're a girl and you got multiple relationships, you're a slut. If you're a dude, you're a hero. I mean, that's pretty much our culture. And as we look at the uh, description of what occurred there, in uh, Genesis, uh, when we've got the story of Judah, with Judah the first Jew, because he sold his brother Joseph into Egypt. Why, why throw him in and let them die in a pit when you can make some money off of them? <laughs> Sorry, Jews. <laughs> Had a neighbor that was a Jew, and he was pretty cool. He said, "Listen, God likes to, you know, he, God is like a Jew. He, he likes to get a little bit of something off the top." on everything and that's how he explains circumcision too it's kind of like tithing um <laughs> lovely probably didn't need to hear that on the holy sabbath then holy just refers to the sun it's like hallowed or sacred uh you know what winds up in sun god worship was if we really check out the entomology of the language so judah you know he had three sons maybe four, whatever. One of them that's married dies before he manages to successfully impregnate his wife, and so back then we also have the law that says, you know, if he doesn't get the job done, one of his brothers is obligated to uh, do the deed. So, uh, I don't know if this girl was unattractive, or maybe the brother was just, you know, really felt that monogamy was the way to go for some reason. Uh, you know, um, that's if you, if, you, if you love someone you don't really generally want to uh, go fiddling around but uh, maybe that's what it was so this guy said no way so God you know Jesus got pissed and killed him because he wouldn't screw his sister-in-law um, so it's straight out of the Bible I hate if it's R-rated or anything but uh, that's just the way the Bible is so then the next guy says all right all right all right you know you know because she complains and says hey you know father-in-law Judah uh, your first boy you know failed your second boy wouldn't, and so God's pissed and killed him. And so uh, you got, I see a couple more there. You got some more boys there. Can any of them uh, get me pregnant so I can have a baby? And, uh, you know, I want to be a mother. I'll be a stay-at-home mom maybe if I can. I don't know how we're going to make it, but uh, I'm sure that the law of Israel provided a way she could glean some things from the fields. Or They weren't agrarian yet, were they? Um, I don't know. They're somehow family welfare. Um should raise children and find some way to survive, maybe. And so the second guy gives it a shot. I guess that should be literal, but, but, but he, you know, he does the he, he does the uh, maneuver that says he uh, basically wasted his ammunition at the last second. Trying not to get too graphic here. There was a, a seminary class that happened to go over this that I was told about by one of my children many years ago, and there was a young fellow in there that was uh, uh, a little bit uh, on the slow side, very nice boy, 
And uh, so he said, uh, teacher, what does it mean he spilt it on the ground? <laughs> I got this report after, after, you know, after, after a seminary from one of my youngsters. And the, the teacher, trying to keep it as close to G-rated as he could when you're dealing with scripture, which is tough, said, well, Jay, let's just say he didn't get the job done. So anyway, Jesus got pissed and killed him too. Um, so Judah's got one more son, and the girl says, hey, you know, um, I'm still not pregnant, you, you know, you're the father-in-law, and, uh, he says, you know, um, I've had three sons, like, you know, have some kind of affiliation with you, even though one of them just said no, and they're all dead. Um, I, I'm into statistics, and this isn't looking good. I'm just gonna say, no. You know what, gospel or no gospel, um, I don't like the way this is looking. I've only got one boy left. He's happily married, and um, let's just uh, let's put this on the shelf. So anyway, she comes up with the strip. Okay, so Judah's daughter-in-law knows what kind of a guy Judah really is. Um, I don't know if you've checked out the genealogy, but um, he is one of the ancestors of Donald Trump, and. Um, Okay, I mean, that might be a stretch, but uh, <clears throat> isn't he a Zionist? Anyway, uh, he knows that Judah's going to be out for some pleasure on a business trip. She knows what Judah really does. Even though he's a holy patriarch, he's not got a chance. He's not going to miss a good... He, he, he's not going to pass up a chance for a good time. He mixes business and pleasure. So she says, I know how I'm going to get pregnant. This guy's definitely good for it. And uh, All right, so there he is. Here's Jesus. Isn't that nice? Um, so uh, the girl says, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not that stupid. I know that Judah's basically as corrupt as any other Christian or Jewish leader will be in the future. And I know he makes his business in pleasure. He's not as holy as he acts. And so he's not going to pass up a chance to have a good time on the way. So she knows he's planning a business trip and figures he's good for fertilizing someone since he does have children. So she dresses up like a prostitute, however that may have been at the time. And it involved covering your face so that way you could, you know, kind of work incognito. And um, there she is. Uh, she, she situates herself along the way where she knows Judah will be passing by. So, um, <clears throat> true to form, Judah says, Hey, sweetie, think we can do a little business here? And uh, so, uh, I don't know, they got a portable tent or doesn't talk about too much of the details, but when they're getting done, you know, with the, the, get, get to the, the payment part, um, Judah says something like, listen, I don't actually have any, uh, any currency here, currency, any, any, any barter goods that I'd normally give you, like, you know, a sheep or a goat or something, um, for your services, but, uh, she says, I'll tell you what, pal, I'll take those little trinkets you got there, um, which kind of were unique, uh, yeah, which proved to be because this girl knew what she was doing and so there she is and uh, so, so she gets you know Judah's special uh, trinkets there that are unique to him identifiably unique to him and he sends back uh, one of his uh, servants slaves whatever low-life employees executive whatever uh, to pay this girl off later when he gets back from his business trip, he can't be troubled with it, but he'll send, you know, one of his servants. So evidently he's not too ashamed of his behavior. It's uh, standard practice and he's not hiding it from his, the boys all know what's going on apparently. So the guy goes and he takes a couple of goats or whatever the deal is. And he, and he comes back and says, Hey, you know, sorry, master Judah. Um, you're, uh, the prostitute was not at the uh, place of business or, you know, wherever she was along the road. She's, she's not there. He's like, whoa, well, you know, I'm a man of my word. I, uh, 
I sent the goats. I guess uh, she can hang on to the, you know, whatever. She's got what she's got. We didn't transact uh, as, as, uh, as I was anticipating. So later on, of course, she starts to enlarge her borders. She looks a little larger. She's pregnant, and Judah goes, You little slut. Look what you've done to the family name, you little whore. We're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to stone you. Sorry, we, we can't have this kind of behavior. She's like, well, you know, um, the guy that impregnated me gave me these. Um, you might recognize them. Yeah, it was you, and you're the father of these children, as well as the grandfather, you incestuous pervert. But, uh, just thought I'd let you know you'd be massacring your own downline here. And he's like, oh, well, I guess that changes everything, you know? I guess you've been more righteous than me, you know, I guess you did have a case, even though, uh, you know, I was losing every one of my boys that tried to have, or even was suggested to be involved with you. I don't know what the deal is, um, but, okay, well, we'll just forget about all that then. And, and, and that is the double standard that we've got in this incredibly misogynistic religion called Judaism and Christianity, right in our own scriptures. So when we have general authorities, when we have general conference in order to, you know, fulfill the corporate requirements of a 501c3 corporation, as they all do, instead of it being some revelation from this God, when we have these, and we have these general authorities speak to us and say, we worship Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, you know, the author and finisher of our salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him might not perish, but have everlasting life. This is who we're talking about. The God that, you know, this is God's word, they say, that had, had, had these Jews tell us that women are basically pieces of crap, you know, and uh, should be treated like that. And, uh, you know, <laughs> they're unfortunate to marry a guy who's a slave. Well, they're basically, you know, they're, they're, they're wrecked for life, even if the guy's going to get out in six years, and then he's got to choose between his family and freedom. Um, it's horrendous. Horrendous. And so all these customs of te uh, all this horrible treatment of people defined in the scriptures we still have in our culture now. This is the, the these sick things that we have in our society are directly traceable to the Judean Christian fountain of religion. And that's what we as Mormons also tie ourselves to as a matter of fact more so than the Christians because we are told that this is a restoration of the ancient religion and the farther back you go the worse these guys are I mean the worst you know Yahweh is horrendous as we've read horrendous you know mass murdered just absolute genocide, including women and children, and the men were just defending their families, so it's not like they were bad guys. And then, you know, rape, human sacrifice. This is the God of the Bible. When we talk about how you're going to treat people that, you know, wake up and discover that they feel like they're gay, being gay is not something that is appealing in, in my eyes, but if somebody, you know, we've been taught that, that these people chose that. They chose it because they're wicked, you know. Uh, it's blasphemy to say that God would screw up like that and put somebody in the wrong body. Spencer Kimball basically said that. You know, bringing up Spencer Kimball and the inspired leadership from heaven, uh, I, I took a look at a uh, little uh, video done by... Uh, Jonathan Streeter recently uh, <clears throat> called uh, Mormon Toxic Perfectionism Thinker of Thoughts so I'm going to borrow a little clip out of that and you might want to take a look at 
at that on his channel and uh, he does a lot of uh, <clears throat> a lot of good stuff he's very good at pointing things out articulating things so uh, take a look at that anyway I'm gonna borrow a little clip here of Spencer Kimball and uh, a little bit of uh, Jeffrey Holland here just a moment this is it fits so well into what we're talking about here so and then I think my I might, I might have to sing we thank the oh God for a prophet there he is Spencer I've, I, I've done that. I, I've sang, we thank the O God to a, for a prophet in front of Spencer. And the LDS Church, of course, acted upon that inspiration of the prophet. Um, actually, I'm not exactly sure on the timing. I don't necessarily pin this on Spencer W. Kimball without... Uh, I mean, I can pin that on him, but 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 the 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 what I'm about to mention, the shock treatment... You know, by like LDS social services, <laughs> or the equivalent thereof. Yeah, you know, shocking these people, um, <laughs> torturing people that were um, feeling like they, you know, weren't looking for someone of the opposite gender. Uh, these actual torture treatments went on church-sponsored. Um, some people aren't aware of that. I didn't learn it in Sunday school, but uh, do your research. Church leaders knew you couldn't pray the gay away. They weren't depending on some divine miracle. They weren't giving a priesthood blessing and having anything work out. They were using the same methods that they use in, uh, you know, prisoner of war camps, Guantanamo Bay, <laughs> those kind of things. Things that work. Torture. Yeah. I wonder how many they cured. But that's not what seems to be the consensus in the scientific community. And, of course, we've heard plenty of people who said they tried to pray the gay away. They wanted to be normal, but they couldn't. And so they suffer rejection, uh, especially within religious communities. And, of course, we know that between ages of 10 and 17 in Utah, which is mostly Mormon, the number one cause of death is suicide. Utah leads the nation in antidepressants. Utah is number three in overall suicide. I assume this is per capita. And uh, all the other two that are ahead of Utah are both in the top ten for percentage of Mormons. Just a coincidence, nothing to worry about. Um, Happy Valley drug overdoses You've probably seen stuff on that you know it's getting famous for that signs of a sick culture and the God of Israel is the fountain of all this sickness as we can find the treatment of people the marginalizing of people who don't fit into the patriarchal order the way the God of Judaism has proclaimed. So you want to go on a mission. You want to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. You want to say that this is the restored order of the ancient patriarchs who gave us these traditions, who gave us what they said is the word of this God of Israel, Yahweh who told us to treat people this way, who justified rape, human sacrifice, and forced you know, sickness or abortion with a filth smoothie off the floor of the filthy temple or tabernacle. Without any, uh, without any proof that the girl had done anything wrong. Now, the hypocrisy is unstinking believable. And I... Maybe, I don't know if I'm going to go through the, all the scriptural references or not. So we got Ephesians chapter 5. We got 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We got something in Timothy or Titus where it basically says, you know, women, girls, you know, keep your mouth shut. You're not going to be preaching any gospel. So I don't know why you'd go on a mission if you're a girl because it says right out there in the New Testament twice, 
you've got no place talking about the gospel. It's a, it's a men's thing, okay? So either it's cultural or this guy is an apostle speaking the word of the Lord. Okay? We saw how God said to treat these people. We saw how his apostles said to treat these people. And now they try to pretend that he's just all loving. Bring your tithing. Do the research. If they claim this is their God, then... Uh, yeah. Who's being hoodwinked? In the name of the Age of Reason, a really informative book and useful for people investigating Christianity and Judaism, written by Thomas Paine. Find it for free to read on uh, sacred texts on the internet. I don't, it's probably .com, it might be .org, I don't remember. But uh, it's there. We see all of the paintings by the great masters always depict the serpent as a woman, which I thought was fascinating. I didn't know that Satan was female. But they, and, and not just you know peripheral, odd sort of artists. We have the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo depicted the serpent as a female on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And I've been on, on, the, on the back of my book, for example, I've got a picture of me standing at the front door of Notre Dame Cathedral. How can you get more mainstream Catholic than that? And there is a, a, a statue, at the, or the base of one of the statues, is this relief that shows the temptation of Eve. And the serpent, very clearly, a female Naga. This was the popular church belief. It never said that the serpent was actually Lilith who was supposed to be Adam's first wife. This is a Talmudic legend. The Talmud doesn't actually clearly say that either. You know, it's just, it's the way that, that people interpret things, right? So you have a Talmudic legend, then you have a biblical legend. This is just people making up their own interpretations for how things are supposed to be. But nowhere does the Bible say that the snake was supposed to be a serpent. The snake in, the, in Genesis was actually adapted from the, uh, the story of uh, Lilith, and the serpent who could not be tamed, who hung out in the hulapu tree, and Gilgamesh went walking through the garden, right? So we have like some of the generations of Genesis right there in earlier mythology. Moving on. We often hear about how the Bible defines marriage. That the Bible defines a marriage as one man and one woman. Except it doesn't do that. It's one man and his clone, it's very often one man and his sister. It's one man and his sister or his clone or an actual regular wife and her maid. Or it's one man and a few hundred wives and concubines. You don't know what a concubine is? That's a live-in personal whore. And then prisoners of war on top of that. So the way that they define marriage is really one man and however many women he could afford to keep in his house. Ten Commandments. Now, this is a funny thing because not only can most Christians not recite what the Ten Commandments say, none of them know what it means, which I think is fascinating. The the thing about you know, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Okay, so, and then we have, and this is according to the Jews, right? Because this is the Jewish religion. This is the Old Testament. This is Yahweh saying, you shall have, have not have any other gods before me. And then you have Jesus pipe up and say, I am the way, to the, there is no other way to the Father but through me, which to me puts Jesus in front of Yahweh. So you have to work out some kind of contradiction where you make up a trinity, which is also not in the Bible. To the best of my knowledge, and if I get anything wrong, ask Matt or be near Matt, he'll definitely tell you where I get anything wrong. <laughs> He's good about that. <laughs> All right, so the, the Ten Commandments says believe it or not, that it's not just that you're supposed to have, you know, you're not supposed to have uh, false gods. That's actually the 11th commandment that is also in Exodus 20. There's 11 commandments in Exodus 20, not 10. And then that list continues through Exodus 21, 22, 23, until Moses finally comes trucking down the mountain with all of the laws and all of the edicts that were given by God. And then he realizes that he's only been gone a few days and his brother has erected a golden calf. So he smashes the tablets because that's his decision and you know, what does God have to do with anything, right? So he can just smash all of this. And then he decides, well, I broke it. Now I have to go back and get the second edition. And for some reason, the second edition is the one that says the Ten Commandments. And it's interesting because God says, I will write exactly what was on the first set. They will be exactly verbatim, except that they're not, any of them. 
It starts out with the first two commandments are paraphrased. You know, it's the same thought. It's not verbatim. It's not, you know, but it's it basically the same thing. And then you get to the third commandment. It's something completely different. Where's it come from? It came from Exodus 22, 23, 20, or, or 20, yeah, 21, 22, and 23. The ones that Christians don't read. Right? They completely omit those. And then there's one, one of those ten commandments, the subsequent ten in Exodus 34, that came out of nowhere. It's not even in the previous chapters. Nowhere. It was just mentioned for the first time. And in these, the real Ten Commandments, the one the Bible says is the Ten Commandments, the one that we should be putting up in the courthouse, is this is the one that says for the Fourth Commandment, instead of thou shalt honor your mother and your father. Oh, there's another one, good one. Why do you honor your mother and your father? Because disobedient children can be killed. This is one of the commandments. You can kill disobedient children. That's why the commandment says honor your father and your mother that you will live a long life. <laughs> So, but in the actual Ten Commandments in Exodus 34, it says that you are to uh, kill your firstborn child on his altar. Now, you can redeem your firstborn son with a goat or with a sheep, but you better have something because it says, nobody comes to me empty-handed. And there are passages in the Bible where there's like Ezekiel, or uh, yes, I think it's Ezekiel who was complaining that other people were taking this literally and they were actually slaughtering their own children in a sacrifice to God, your firstborn son. Because this was a requirement. And the most important one, of course, the tenth one, the, the, it has, that you can't boil a baby goat in its own mother's milk. Because that'd be creepy. <laughs> but it's not just that the second set of, t of commandments are all jacked up. It's also that the first ones are jacked up. Because you know what about, about keeping the graven images, the eleventh commandment? In the, I think it's the second commandment that describes it as, you know, thou shalt not make any kind of depiction of anything that is in heaven or the earth. Second statement, neither shall you worship them. So the commandment is not that you're not allowed to worship graven images. The, the, the commandment is not that you're not, it's, it's that you're not allowed to make graven images. You are not allowed to depict any recognizable thing in heaven or earth, which allows only abstract art, only by omission. So that's how messed up that is. Right? And I did another presentation talking about the Ten Commandments, going through those original ten and then the subsequent ten, where we talk about, you know, how are the Ten Commandments, how, how, are, how is the United States based on these Ten Commandments? Because in Texas, we have the Ten Commandments out in front of our state capitol, and when we complained about that, the governor said, it doesn't matter, it's been there a long time, it was there longer than you, so shut up. That's basically their excuse. But they, wanted, they actually put in our Texas textbooks, our history textbooks, in Texas, now state, or at least one of them says, that our Constitution, the United States Constitution, is based on our textbooks actually say that the U.S. Constitution was based on a covenant between God and Moses, and that Moses was a real person, a historic person, who was born about 1250 B.C. This is in our history textbooks. And I had to give a testimony to the Board of Education, wherein I said, Moses is a mythical character, this is somebody believed on faith, who you know, most scholars and archaeologists and so forth are now saying that there, there can't have been a Moses, and there's logical arguments why there couldn't have been a Moses, and I'll give you just one of them, just to make it easy, and because I'm just making this up as I go along. <laughs> Think about this. When you, the, the Bible says that you had 600,000 men on foot in the town of Ramses. Right? Now, this isn't including the old people. This isn't including the children, the, the women, any of their animals. Just 600,000 Hebrew men on foot. Right. So this is the active warrior types. And, up, and, and these are in one town at a time when the entirety of Egypt had a population of only 3 million. Why didn't the Hebrews just own the whole country? Because if you've got 600,000 people in one town, and, you, and they already outnumber most of the population elsewhere in, in any given town, you'd think they would just take it over, right? Now think about it this way. If they're going to start from Ramses, and they're going to walk to Canaan, right? Uh, let's say they do something easy, rather than using God's guidance. Let's say that they follow the coastline. How can you get lost following the coastline? And if, each, if they started out single file, one man walking at least one meter ahead of the next one, which is a reasonable distance if everybody's walking single file, because there's 600,000, that just those guys, you know, not even talking about all of the other people, so we're talking about two million people now, population there. So if the 600,000, the first ones would get to Canaan, before the last ones left, if they've left single file. And it would take roughly two weeks to get there. 
But with God's help, they end up wandering 40 years in the desert and having, I don't know, having to eat bird bread or whatever the hell's falling out of the sky. I don't know what that story's about. The definition of faith always comes up. And this is a perplexing one for me because everything that I could find, not just in the Bible, but in the Quran and in the Bhagavad Gita and in the various tomes of some other religions too, every time I come across a description or a definition of faith, it says something or describes something that is consistent with the general dictionary definition of being a firm or confident belief that is not based on evidence. But you are blessed if you can see what is not there. Do we hear the stories about, you know, how uh, you have these undead, undead saints in Matthew that are wandering around downtown Judea as a result of Jesus being crucified, which, you know, none of the other Gospels happen to mention. But we, as outrageous as that is, and even though the other Gospels didn't mention it, we know that this was verified because they appeared to many witnesses. Many unnamed, anonymous, illiterate witnesses who never recorded any of it and likely were no more real than the zombies they were supposed to be reporting. So uh, what I often hear, and this is a very frustrating thing to me, that it is the projection and equivocation when it comes to faith. Now, this is a big one for me. I'm an epistemist. I identify faith as being the most dishonest position it is possible to have because it is dishonest to state a fact that is not a fact. If you're going to assert something is a fact and it's not a fact, that's a lie. But that's what all religions do, assert things as fact that are not evidently true. But then worse than that, many religious organizations, and particularly creationist organizations, proudly post, as if this were something to be proud of, their statement of faith, wherein they phrase it different ways, but they're making the admission that they have already rejected all the evidence there could ever be. So that if what they believe is not true, if evolution is true, this is what they don't want to deny, they, they will not accept or admit that they're wrong or have been proven wrong ever at any point. And the only thing they admit is that they'll never admit when they're wrong. They'll never admit that they're proven wrong. I mean, I think William Lane Craig even said something along those lines. Is ever, if there's ever a conflict between the Bible and Scripture, I mean, excuse me, the, the Bible and science, science got it wrong. You just, it doesn't matter what you can prove. My interpretation trumps that. I'm sorry to use that word. <laughs> I should be more careful about objectable language. Right? And then they use the other equivocation and say, well, my faith is based on evidence. No, it's not. <laughs> it's completely against the definition, every definition, for what faith is. And once again, I'm not limiting this to the dictionary. I'm, I'm taking it from Scripture, from every reference that describes what faith is. All of them. Not just from the Bible, but also in the Quran. And also in the Bhagavad Gita, and as I said, from, from some other neo-pagan sources too, they all describe faith the same way. You're going to believe what you want to believe because you want to believe it, and it doesn't matter if it's true, is a good summation, I think. And then next, let me see if I had anything else here. Uh, the descriptions of the earth. Wouldn't it be nice if there was some accurate information in the Bible somewhere? The Bible doesn't describe anything about the earth or our history or any of it accurately. We know there was no Adam and Eve. We know that there was no global flood. And it's a sad thing that you are required to believe absolute horseshit for no reason as a requirement of salvation. As Ken Ham puts it, if you want to believe in salvation, which is the second half of the Bible, you have to believe in creation, which is the first half of the Bible, so he will make allowances that you must pretend. And he said, he's seen the evidence. He's seen where you have brain cancer in dinosaurs, right, that are, you know, 66 million years old or whatever. And he says, well, that can't be good. And God said when he created everything, it was good. So he's going to take the, the book of stories, which, by the way, is not God talking. I know that people can write stories. People write holy books. All the other holy books are written by people. Why not this one too? So if you, you know, you have people give you the choice. Are you going to believe you know, man or are you going to believe God? Well, I'm going to believe, if I'm going to believe a storybook and the earth itself proves the storybook is wrong, if God wrote one of them, I'm thinking he wrote the earth. The record in the rocks is going to trump the words of man and the interpretations and the th 35 different versions of it, however many there are, and the you know, 35,000 different denominations of Christianity, which is just one of many religions. How many different ways can we get this wrong? And that's your absolute truth. And then you have a dozen people that all claim to have the absolute truth, and they all contradict each other completely. So logically, 
One of them could possibly be, but more likely, infinitely more likely, they're all wrong. Including science is going to be wrong on something. <laughs> and that's the better way to look at it. Rather than have your salvation determined by whether you believe, right? Imagine judging people not on your actions, but on your belief. How immoral is that? I have a huge problem just with that. For an eternal damnation especially. I just want accurate information. The only value that information can have is how accurate you can show it to be. And if you can't show that it is accurate at all, then it has no value at all. And so when I go to listen, if I go sit in a church at some point and I listen to a preacher and a stand who's talking like I am right now, I'm going to be judging him on how much of what he says can I show is actually true. And unfortunately, of course, with sermons, I get nothing. And I've got no, there's nothing to compel me to believe. There's no logic behind it that I have to walk away feeling completely dissatisfied. And I don't have a strong closing like Seth did. So I'm just going to say, bye. R and raw. He's just saying some things that I say, but he, he puts a few things together in ways that, you know, sometimes you hear it from someone else. Might help. Even if I am more handsome than him, but I never show my face. <laughs> All right, just being a jerk. So I just want to mention a couple more things here. I want to throw in a little Brigham Young. You know, we we hear that Brigham Young said a number of offensive things, and uh, things like, you know, I take no more thought about grabbing another wife, acquiring another wife, than I would another cow. Um, and you wonder where he gets that kind of stuff. Uh, you wonder about Joseph Smith, and most people have no idea what the spiritual wife system was about. I've published stuff on that on, on the, you know, on the YouTube. Most of it was reading uh, accounts of, you know, the, the sworn testimony of Joseph Jackson. And, uh, you yeah, maybe some corroborating stuff from uh, Sarah Pratt and so forth. Nope. The church doesn't discuss this. The arguments, the apologists aren't discussing this. This is not part of what's on LDS.org's, uh, you know, gospel topic essay that tries to draw away the attention from what happened uh, in Nauvoo or with Joseph Smith in general as a, you know, complete adulterer, womanizer. Um, Brigham Young was horrendous the way he treated women and uh, it's just been a massive cover-up but all we hear is, oh, you know, we honor women, put them on this pedestal and all this good stuff. I don't know if that we hear the pedestal stuff anymore. Maybe that's that's gone by the wayside, but oh, well, you're a daughter of God, you're valued, but you know, you're taught in young women's, or you were, that you know, if you messed up and had a premarital relationship of a physical nature, you know, better, it had been better that you were dead than have, you know, suffered such things. As a matter of fact, if you were a young man, you know, was it Romney, or, you know, talking about that story, not Mitt, you know, like Mary G. Romney or somebody, somebody was, oh, I was, you know, I'd rather have my son come home in a casket, you know, dead in a box, than to have lost his virtue. Well, um, it's a good idea to be married and know how you're going to, you know, have, a, have an agreement with how you're going to take care of children, but uh, resulting from physical relationships, but basically devaluing something to the point where they're, they're better off dead um, is, has been psychologically and emotionally damaging to a lot of people that have had, um, you know, experiences where they felt they did what you know was a mistake and it's certainly uh you know as we're taught in church uh concerning morality um devaluing people but evidently it didn't matter for judah because uh different for guys and uh anyway what we see is is horrendous treatment uh uh this whole, all this young womanhood crap that you hear in church, if, if you just source it, if you say this comes from the God of Israel, you got another thing coming. That's what I want to say. That's another reason we don't have the journal discourses, because what Brigham said was, uh, <clears throat> he's a pretty horrendous individual from everything I've read. If you, if, if, if you really look into it, uh, you know, being head of the, basically, you know, the Danites were underneath him, he was a grand archie, so, um, a hit squad it's a murder squad it's a secret society it's basically they ran they ran something like the mafia in nauvoo and henceforth what brigham ran afterwards it's a criminal enterprise and uh it's ruining lives today